So uh, before I show the demo, one of the things I want to mention is like there are some principles that um, apply to any programming language that you use. It's like okay, in .NET you have namespaces. Same way as like in ESJS or Centjs, you should be using namespaces. You should not write inline methods. So for example, in case of uh, uh, you know C sharp, now you can write anonymous methods, and anonymous methods can be part of another method. So they have access to all the variables that are part of that method. But then, like the scope chaining becomes an issue. So you should try to avoid having, uh, like you know, um, methods inside methods inside methods. Avoid doing that. Most of your methods should not exceed like 30 to 40 lines of code. Because if they do, then there will be a point where you will feel that okay, I'm in a maze now. I don't understand what is going. Because JavaScript, as I said, like it's a scripting language. So like everybody thinks you have to write everything in single script, but that's not true. That's why we have in HTML, you can include the script text. So you can have your code divided into different files so that you don't have to write everything in a single file. You can logically group them. Okay. Another thing, these examples do not really show or teach how to use the class system. There is a complete tutorial on Sencha site on their documentation how to use their class system. Okay, but examples don't use it because they want to show you the simplest method of using the component. Okay. And the reason I'm telling you all this is like, uh, again, when you go to your office or your home, you play with these, then it may feel that okay, it's very easy to start with, but then like you will get stuck at a point that, okay, how do I organize all this? So it's better you see these demos for the capabilities of the framework, and then get started in a proper manner. And to get started, there are a lot of books. There is a book by Jay Garcia, like, um, uh, he has it most for both ESJS and Sencha Touch. Okay, it's called ESJS in um, action and Sencha Touch in action. Both are very good books. He teaches everything step by step. Okay, so it's it's a good starting point. And then again, like their website itself has a lot of stuff. Now another thing that I want to point out is the framework both ESJS and Sencha Touch have been developing at a very rapid pace. Due to that documentation is not always up to date. Okay? So sometimes you may find things that are inaccurate. But the big thing is since you have access to the source code, most of the times you can figure out what is going on wrong. And their documentation has inline comments, so you will find people have already commented about it. Okay? Then they have a forum system where like you can post your question and if you post your question nicely, then you will get an answer like uh, fairly quickly. Okay? So I'm just going to go through some of the um, demos um, just to like uh, give you an idea of what all um, ESTJS is capable. Okay. So um, one of the easiest way to start is like a kitchen sink application. So one thing again, like just in this particular, this is the documentation system, and these examples are within the documentation system itself. So think about it like you have so many tabs open, right? You have like you know um, so many panes that you can resize, right? And then you can you have like you know all closable, dockable, all these kind of capabilities are there. And all this is done using HTJS and Chitas. And for this, the developer do not the developers do not have to write any HTML or CSS. You write pure component based. Okay, I need a component or I need a panel that needs to be collapsible. You specify a property like you do in .NET. You specify, okay, this has to be this title. You just specify properties, right? Height, width, whether it is collapsible, whether it is maximizable, meaning like whether you want it a dialog box or whatever. So it's all property driven. So it's very similar to what you do in .NET. But you have to get used to it because the writing style is, is different. As I mentioned earlier, Sencha Architect does have a drag drop kind of a functionality where you can uh, do like you can do in .NET ID. But frankly, like as you go further, you will realize that it's not the best way to develop. You can write code faster. <coughs> okay. So uh, let me just move around because I'm not duplicating my screen. So let me see if I can duplicate the screen. Okay. We 
should be similar. So again, like as I mentioned, they do have different themes. So if you see, like uh, you can change the theme from here. They have given an example. So the classic theme is something that actually really, like, you know, kicked off all the interest in uh, HJS because it looked really like Windows applications, and it looked like okay, you are delivering Windows applications in the web browser. Okay. And again, like if you see, like you have toolbars, and like you can move things around. Um, another big um, example that a lot of people like is like their web desktop, which is basically like a you know a Windows desktop like environment, but all done using EHTJS. Um, if you see like uh, you have a start button, you have windows, you can minimize, maximize. You see your start button, you have settings, logo. So all these like again, most of for most of these things you do not have to do like any custom CSS or HTML. So from a development perspective, like you just focus on uh, basic functionality of what is out of the box. Then like they have grids, like those are uh, one of the like you know famous components of EXTJS. Grids have like a lot of functionality, like you can do grouping, you can like uh, hide or show groups, and then like they have. So you see like everything is like running almost instantaneously because it's not going to the back end at all. This data is already available on the client side. But if you want it, it could interact with the server side data also. But the speed is going to be really fast because you are not transferring any HTML or anything. You are just transferring data back from the server. But that's why the amount of data is very small usually. And most of the data is text, so it is compressed. So the data, even like the data, usually in our applications, we get a throughput of like less than 50 milliseconds for most of the response back from the server. So it's really, really fast. It looks like it's almost 10 minutes. Okay. So they have, they have like you know tools like um, you can do like uh, filtering, sorting. So like in this case, like if I want to <coughs> apply a filter, so as I type, so if you see like it has filtered on that. Right, so if you see like uh, you know this moving capability is again like uh, you can make any of the windows uh, draggable. You can easily drag the windows. Okay, uh, same with like uh, they have uh, different. So another big thing that we have seen a lot of uh, companies are asking is about accessibility, because like if you go into any government organization, then they ask for like okay whether this application is going, uh, how is it going to behave, and like uh, you know people with disabilities. <coughs> access this application. So one thing I want to mention that they have made good strides, but HTJS is still not up to par to deliver to this um, kind of audience. Okay? Because we have uh, seen like where like it does not work that well. So in that case, like stay away from HTJS at least for now. Okay? So uh, tab panel again like one of the most common things like you can have multiple tab panels. So you can go through this kitchen sink application just to look at the framework capabilities. Okay, now I'm going to show an application that we developed like way back in 2007. Okay, it has not been updated since then. It was just like a kind of a playground, but like we have been using it just to give you an idea. Like at that time, what capabilities existed and like how you can do. Because we have a lot of client applications, but I cannot demo them like without their permissions. And since those are products, so they don't want it to be disclosed that you know like uh, we have been working for them. Let me show you. So this is like a, it's not duplicating. Okay, let me just change. So this is one of my uh, pet projects. Like this was a product I developed way back in like um, 1993. It was called Kunri. It was a Windows-based application. It was based on Indian astrology. So like I converted it uh, back into ESTJS so that it's available on the web. So if you see, like uh, the only thing I changed was like uh, change the theme to the gray, and then brought almost everything uh, onto the web. So a couple of things to show in this is like so like uh, the birthplaces are dependent on country. So if you were developing a uh, like you know a regular .NET application just to make a drop down dependent on another drop down drop down is like you know a challenge. 
you can have with like code behind and all that like doing pushbacks but like how fast it is because in this case like the places the list of places is like close to 90000 places uh, that are in this campus but let us just change to so if you see like the drop down is very fast like as i type in so it shows clean now another thing that you notice is like it also has paging the drop down itself has paging so like components like Telray and like you know all those have been having this like since 2007, but the performance that, as I was talking about is not really up to the part. Now um, one of the things I want to show you guys is like how this is all even working. Okay. So so I just have this um, Chrome debugger open and like I just have the network tab open just so that you can see what is going on. So as I type in, so let us see, okay. So what the system has determined that, okay, I have less than 10 choices left, so it has not even made a backend call. Because I have given a page size 10, okay. But if like I type in something like, and so if you see like it immediately made a backend call, which is just to an ASPX page, which like you all are familiar with like what are ASPX pages, right? So in this, I just said, okay, somebody typed in M. And I said, okay, parent record type is country, scope is 218, the country ID that they typed in was like 218. And based on that, I got this response that there are 28 records, but I'm going to get only the first 10 records. So that the system knows that, okay, if they decide to go to the next page, they can move. So from the system perspective, if you think like it didn't bring any HTML or anything, it's just like behaving as a data transfer mechanism. So all the business logic is on the back end, UI is just a presentation. And that's where like the thinking changes when you divide your application into client versus the backend system. Okay, and again like we chose .NET because the same application is delivered on like mobile platforms like as native applications. It's a Windows desktop application and now like we converted the same thing into web. We didn't have to change much. It's just the data system has changed that we are returning JSON instead. So again like XML was popular initially we did with XML but now like XML is almost gone because of the size that it has and JSON is native to the browser so that's why we are using JSON. Okay. Then um, this was like a very simple like it doesn't really have anything complex um, stuff in, going on but um, just show. So in this like uh, this is one of the grids like it's out of the box so you can resize the columns you can sort and you can hide and show columns so for these, like you don't even have to write any code. It's just out of the box, okay? And you can combine a lot of capabilities of these systems to deliver really powerful applications. So this is the application that I was talking about that we developed a long time back. So like this is like kind of a portal that we have for a lot of our employees in India. So if you see like, a, it's like kind of a portal homepage and you can move stuff around, okay? And then um, let me just bring One of, uh, so let me just bring like, a, so this is basically like a, you know, like everybody has issue tracking, right? So we used to use a product called Assembler. You may have heard about it. So it used to be free and that's when we use, but one day they decided, okay, they are going to start charging. So overnight, like I said, and said, okay, fine, we are not going to pay. So I developed something in a day to just do the project tracking. And we have been using that since and like we have not made any modifications. But I'm just going to go through like, you know, some of the stuff that we have been doing. So in this, like again, if you see, uh, this is the list of all the tickets that we have in the system. So again, if you see, like I collapse the grid and immediately like I have more space available. Again, I did not have to code much about it. I just specify a property collapsible to and it becomes collapsible. Okay. Now, um, in this I see like there are about 42 tickets, right? So now I want to say uh, filter based on the status. Okay. So. So I just filtered based on creative, right? So I see only 16, correct? Now, what we did on top of this is that, okay, I don't want to see all these columns, okay? So I don't want to see the component type created by days since creation, dates. I don't see any, I don't want to see any of these columns, okay? So like, 
a lot of applications that we deliver in line of business is like you have to create reports, right? So you, somebody may want, okay, I want to see these five columns in my report. It should be sorted by, say, title. It should be sorted by priority or whatever, okay? So what we decided, okay, fine. If they can see everything, every ultimately everybody wants to see the data on screen. Printout is the last thing that we want, right? So if we can present all the data on the screen first, they can decide how they want it to look and then they can export in PDF or Excel. That will make our life simpler, we don't have to create as many reports. So what we did, okay, you customize this, right? So now you can just save it as a preference. And I can set it as a default also that, okay, fine, I want to see, when I log in into the system, by default I want to see this view. So like, again, using ext.js with .NET. So in this case, what we did was like, we already know what columns you want to see. So we created a database table in the backend. And then as you say save, which saves what is the preference that user has. And then when he's coming back at that time, we bring, okay, what is the preference he saved? So now the system becomes much more capable. Again, PDF export or Excel export is not something ext.js does, right? But we know that, okay, fine, we are seeing 16 records on the screen, so we know what parameters that the user has specified so far, right? So we, we already know on the back end, so I can just say export and then say PDF. So this is coming, uh, this is running all through my mobile, so like it's a bit slow, so it should still. So you see the PDF output, right? And you see like it is exactly the same columns that I, have, I had on the screen and even the width of the columns is based on how much width I had adjusted my columns to. So by combining both the client side and the server side, now we have given the capability to the end user create as many reports as you want. Now on top of this what we created was, okay fine, now they have created these views. So let us say like I want to see any tickets that are created say within last 24 hours, email to me. If I can generate the PDF on the back end, then I can email it as well on the schedule. So that's where .NET comes into. We have task schedulers where users can go, subscribe, okay, fine. I have created this view. I want every 24 hour what has been created in last 24 hours or whatever view you create. So you see like how you can utilize because the front end gives you the capability to manage your data and then back end just processes and does all the Okay. Then uh, you just saw an example of a very simple filter. Now like I have created, right? If I just wanted to do a filter on something else as well, I could easily do. So it's not that you can apply only one filter at a time. You can change the sorting, you can change the grouping, you can do like whatever you want. So that's the basic so if you see like even on the phone, the performance of the system, like it's it's pretty good. Like I wouldn't say like it's exceptional because it's running on a very low grade system, like it's running on an Atom server, which is serving maybe like hundreds of websites. Okay, these are like just for like you know, our internal use, but still like the performance is very good because the data transfer is very, very good. Okay? Then as you can see, like you have different tabs of them. So again, like so Again, like uh, if we were thinking in traditional terms, we'll think about iframes, right? If you have the similar kind of stuff, like okay, fine, we can create iframes and then we'll start using the same kind of component. In this case, it's not a, an iframe, it's just a grid panel and you can create as many views as you want. So I have like info drive and I, let us say this, I saw find VCPL shaker, so it's opening a new tab, okay? Now if you see, again, in this one, I have the Lux view of created tickets. I apply that and I immediately see my particular preference. But apply it to the data that is related to this particular project. So that those are the kind of capabilities that ext.js and Touch can give you on the client side for the user interface to make it much easier for the user to manipulate the data and then at the back end you can customize how really it works. Okay? Then I'm going to also give you a demo of like how to create <coughs> Um, a send a ext.js application from scratch, okay, just bare bones application, so that you can get started 
when you, I'm sure like you know, at least some of you will be excited about this, but how do you create an application? Which is like, you know, again, uh, there, are, there is so much documentation on uh, Sencha's site that you may get lost. Okay? So first thing is like you download Sencha SDK tools, okay? and then like I'll show you how to use them. Okay? But uh, let's just go through like some other features. So this application is done in ext.js2. Now like ext.js is at version 4. So if you think about like the capabilities that exist at that time versus like what they may have created now, so it has evolved a lot. So this we could do in like 2007, so think like what we can do in like, you know, uh, 2013. Okay, like these three components and all. So, um, to give you another example, like um, pop-ups. So like this is a, just a form, okay? But this is like again a virtual pop-up. So like pop-ups have been really popular there, okay, so that because almost all the browsers block pop-ups these days. So you have a lot of components to like, you know, show a virtual pop-up. But how do you really use that? In ExpJS, again, like window is a common component, and then in that you can embed like a grid, form, whatever you want. Okay? It's all component based. You can embed anything into anything. So either you have a container or you have a component. So in a container, you can arrange components any way you want. So you don't have to think a lot again like about um, you know um, design or like HTML or CSS anywhere else. So if you see like out of the box in this whole layout. Everything looks very similar. So it's not like okay, somewhere the color is different, somewhere else the color is different. Because again, the developers did not deal with any of the color combinations or anything. It's just whatever was out of the box. Okay. And you see, like okay, this field is marked as required, so like automatically it gives a hint. So again, I did not have to code anything. I said okay, this field is required. And then it has that uh, squiggly line, and then like uh, it has that pop up cool tip, whatever you want. So those are like a lot of things that are available out of the box okay then again one of the extensions so like as we talked about like you know people um, writing extensions so one of the things that when uh, one of um, our client was using it they said okay we really don't use mouse how do you use your application so we said okay that's a tough ask <laughs> because like you know these are web applications so we created shortcuts so if you see like uh, save um, and close like it has uh, a underline right so we discovered that okay, there is a global mapper that you can assign in ext.js so that it basically is monitoring the whole DOM element and whenever a key is pressed, we identify where the key was at pressed and based on that we identify what is the closest context and then like we assume that okay, that button was pressed. So like those kind of extensions like are like, again I had to spend about 3-4 hours to do that but still if you think about like when if something of this sort you have to even think about in like .NET existing components, it's just very difficult to ask that okay, how do we assign shortcuts in an um, application. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand you correctly. So, are you saying that within here, uh, in the um, uh, XJS basically it monitors that if all the A was pressed? So, within the EXJS by default doesn't. So we added a global listener that whenever a key is pressed with alt, 